Welcome, fellow unemployables, to this week's edition of Seven Figure Small, the show that provides creative freelancers and entrepreneurs like you with compelling stories and actionable strategies for living the seven figure small lifestyle. This is our 178th episode overall. And it's the second episode of Seven Figure Small Live, in which we broadcast our recording with a live audience of Unemployable Initiative members here on Zoom. I'm your host, Jared Morris, partner and community leader here at Unemployable. And to begin the proceedings here today, let me introduce to my left. He is my partner at Unemployable and my Seven Figure Small co-host. He's a serial digital entrepreneur who has started several seven figure businesses, plus one eight figure business that was acquired in 2019. He's a writer, a traveler, a curator, and a lover of Gen X music, which makes me wonder what his reaction was to the weekend's Super Bowl halftime show. I was like, ah! mm, so it was the same reaction as the rest of us. He is Brian Clark. Brian, what's on your mind this week? <laughs> I'll be honest, I did not watch the Super Bowl at all, but I did watch the recap of the YouTube video of Prince's Super Bowl performance, which is the GOAT. And I I guess I have to also admit that Tom Brady is the GOAT bastard. Um, (laughs) But yeah, what's on my mind? A lot of reminiscing, you know, it's funny. Uh, People, the youngins out there, you know, they're talking about the old school stuff like it's new again. And that of course does my heart well. Um, You know, I I think people are kind of getting that uh, it's not all new and shiny. We've got some fundamentals here, but I've been going through, you know, having to reflect, um, you know, all the way back to 99, you know, 2005, 2006, uh, when I started copy blogger and, And my hero, Darren Rouse, sent me my first meaningful link, and the rest is history. But, uh, you know, it's uh, I've been doing this because I may or may not be writing a book. I am not committing to anything at this point, Um, but it's been interesting. But more than anything, I am just happy to be here uh, with a couple of people who uh, were early allies and friends. Uh, We started something called a virtual community, which is very trendy now uh, since the the pandemic has isolated us. Uh, But this was 2008, which is kind of amazing, um, especially given that currently Unemployable has a virtual community and so does Copyblogger. But uh, it was really these two guys, Darren and Chris, who made that one of the uh, highlights of my career. And uh, it's pretty cool to have them on the show. So I guess that was me stealing your thunder and introducing them. But go ahead. All right. With that said, let's do it. Let's introduce these two guys. (laughs) We will start over here to my right. He's one of the two kindest and most genuine people you'll ever meet on the internet, and the other one is our other guest. He's a New York Times bestselling author, a renowned brand strategist, and his latest project is The Backpack Show with the tagline, it's a business show, only fun. Uh, Of course it's fun. Anything involving this guy is fun. He is Chris Brogan. Chris, welcome to Seven Figure Small Live. Let's start with this. What is the most unemployable thing about you? The most un- I think everything about me is unemployable. I think I'm absolutely unfit for human consumption at this point. <laughs> I'm furry and weird looking and I have strange ideas. And more often than not, these days, I get hired to break things almost as much as I get hired to build them. So I don't know. I, I, I it's, it's one of those things. The first ever time I said I was going to be a consultant years and years and years ago, this very important CEO guy says to me, oh, so you're unemployed? And I said, huh. And I never really thought about it. But ever since unemployable uh, became a better thing to think about, I always think about the fact that one way to be a, you know, a consultant is just to be utterly unemployable. And here I am. Hmm. Very good. Okay. And to my other right. He's the other kindest and most genuine person you'll ever meet on the internet or anywhere else for that matter. You know him as the founder of ProBlogger and Digital Photography School, where he's been helping bloggers and photographers reach their goals for almost two decades now. And he, as Brian mentioned, along with Chris and Brian, founded Third Tribe many moons ago, a trip down memory lane that we will take later in this episode. He is Darren Rouse. Darren, welcome to Seven Figure Small Live. What is the most unemployable thing about you? 
Uh, like like Chris, I think there's a lot. Um, I haven't had a job for 20 years, so uh, I don't have any referees or anything to put on my resume, really. And uh, if you Google me, you'll find all kinds of things that just aren't true. So uh, I think those things probably are a big part of it. <laughs> and lastly, I think uh, my attention span is... Um, is shrinking by the day. Um, and so I'm not sure that really helps at all. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> That's about right. That's about right. That is. Okay. So here's what we have on tap for you on this week's edition of Seven Figure Small Live. We are going to begin with headlines. We'll discuss some of the hottest topics affecting freelancers and entrepreneurs. And then we will dive into our main topic which this week will be about how the classic internet, which these three guys helped pioneer, is coming back in style. And finally, we will end with some Q&A with live audience participation, not only welcomed, but encouraged to those of you who are here live. So get your questions in the chat if you have them. But let's start with headlines. And our first headline today, guys, is about Twitter's upcoming paid newsletter service. So last month, Twitter acquired the Dutch newsletter platform Review, uh, and a newsletter link has now been added to the Twitter web app. If you haven't seen it yet, it is in there. Uh, so you can expect the full integration for this to be rolled out over the coming months. There's still The integration isn't there yet, but it, it's going to be rolled out. And so my question, and Chris, we'll start with you. Uh, is this a smart move by Twitter? And what do you think it suggests about the future of newsletters? It, it's kind of an also ran in a, in a category where... The benefit's going to be that people who trust Twitter will trust this platform. They don't have to run off and look at some of the other platforms that are allowing for paid newsletter subscriptions. Uh, it'll obviously be just a wee bit more integrated. Uh, and there's a chance that I might be able to invite my entire Twitter subscriber base to that newsletter, which I can't particularly do with any other of the paid newsletter platforms. That alone might make it a little more interesting because, you know, 300 and something thousand people follow me on Twitter. If I can spam invite all of them to get my paid newsletter, I would do way better than you know my existing lists. Beyond that, paid, ne- paid newsletters in general are on a huge uptick. Uh, people have suddenly spun back around and went, wait, wait, I heard these newsletter things are cool, and they're back at it. Um, but there, there's going to be a, a boom and a bust because, like anybody knows, it turns out you actually have to pr- put content in them. Uh, for people to pay you money. You have to actually, you know, type and make words and stuff like that. So I think it's going to be a kind of come and go slot, but I'm excited about it. Yeah. Darren, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I find it fascinating that Twitter are doing it. I think um, it'll be interesting to see how it goes for them as a revenue stream for them. I know they've been looking for that for a while. My concern over it is deliverability. Um, as with any newsletter um, service, um, it's only ever as good as what they're able to deliver um, outside of a spam box or outside of Gmail's um, promotions tab. Um, and what I found over the years is that every new email service, newsletter service starts off really well, but uh, as more and more internet marketers get into it and start doing dubious things, deliverability plummets. And I've seen it time and time and time again. I'll be interested to see how they're going to deliver those emails and whether they're um, getting through. But um, yeah, as Chris says, I think if you have uh, an engaged audience on Twitter already and there's integration between it, I think there's um, certainly potential there. So um, watch this space, I guess. What do you think, Brian? You've had thoughts on newsletters in the past. Have I? Yeah, <laughs> I've had thoughts. Um, like last week uh, with Substack, uh, I kind of consider it a solution in search of a problem for people like us who build websites and have our email service provider convert kit now contains a free newsletter function or paid newsletter function, I should say, in addition to other digital products. So I'm not sure um, now until Chris said the whole distribution thing last week, I said, if Substack provided meaningful distribution, uh, uh, discovery, if you will, for newsletter creators, then that's something. I mean, Medium had that promise. I think it was largely false, but um, at least they tried on the blogging front. Uh, so it, it's all interesting. I mean, you know, those of us like the three here who've been on Twitter since the very beginning, you know, a, a lot of our accounts, I think people gave up and went away. So I don't even know if spamming them uh, actually matters. 
But that's interesting. It will be interesting to see how Twitter, uh, if it's just a Me Too product that they're copying, uh, you know, with regard to Substack. But Substack, for those who are interested in that, seems to have done pretty well. I don't understand why people use it necessarily, but uh, it's it's doing the job. You know, people are always attracted to platforms that they think will make their life easier uh, or get them to succeed quicker. But as uh, the esteemed Sonia Simone once said, don't take shortcuts. They take too long. And that's what I see this again. (laughs) Well said, Sonia. All right. Our second headline is actually a follow-up to a topic that we discussed here last week with Ryan Dice. And that is that Mark Cuban is a co-founder of a clubhouse competitor that is called or will be called Fireside. So if you haven't seen uh, this yet, it's going to be similar to Clubhouse in that it will facilitate live audio conversations. The big difference, at least right now, seems to be that Fireside will allow the conversations to be recorded. So Darren, we'll start with you here. What do you think about this new wave of audio-only apps And do you prefer the clubhouse model or what's being proposed here by Fireside? I'm not overly sold on live audio. Um, I don't know whether that's just my personality type. Um, I much prefer if I'm listening to audio to actually set aside the time to listen to something that I I, um, think has been purposely edited for me so that I am going to use my time effectively. Um, the, The few times I've got on clubhouse, I've kind of found them fairly rambling um, and not really tightly produced. And so for me, um, it's it's a tricky, I'm, I'm not saying that there's not great shows out there. So um, I'm not, not sure about the medium. In terms of Fireside versus Clubhouse, I do like the idea of being able to record. And I guess that's essentially what we're doing here. I think as um, uh, someone who has a podcast or has had a podcast in the past, the ability to run a live recording of it is certainly worth doing. But I can do that already on Zoom. I can do that already on Facebook Lives where I've already got an audience. Um, yeah. yeah, so... I don't know if it's solving anything that I um, can't do already. It, it's such a good point. And that's why, you know, as I look at this, Brian, it really seems like whichever one of these, because like, I can see where live audio is going to fit in, but I really feel like at some point, one of these apps is going to have to let producers have more options, be able to produce from your desktop because we're doing live right now, but you know, we've got some production value to it and there's music coming in and we can provide a better audio experience. And that's what's missing. With these, and so I really feel like whoever actually opened now, users can just listen on the app. I think that's fine, but they're going to have to open it up so producers have more options when they're producing the audio. So it's not just getting on there with conversation. I think. Well, in terms of billionaire influence, Cuban showed up a little late since Elon and Zuckerberg already showed up in Clubhouse, uh, and Zuckerberg's going to copy it like he always does for Facebook. So there's that. Here's what's interesting. Beyond, you know, this application or that application, I was doing a little digging into the technology that powers Clubhouse, and it's a company called Aurora, and they basically built this uh, audio environment uh, development framework, if you will. And there's even, you know, they have uh, even people like us could build our own audio app and and you're thinking, okay, you know, maybe that's not so interesting. We've got other tools and what have you, but thinking down the line, this is the talking component of virtual reality. This is the application that could power. Once we get the visual part of virtual environments, I have a feeling this technology or one like it will be part of that that so look down the road a little bit when you are in an immersive environment uh, with other people with avatars and all that good you know Ready Player One stuff. Um, so the technology underlying it, kind of like blockchain, is more interesting than Bitcoin. Well, until recently, <laughs> thanks Elon. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'm watching it, but I don't really care about participating. I would much rather get together with people like this produce, you know, something, produce media, not just uh, a chat room with audio, but you got to look down the road because the possibilities are going to be pretty amazing. Yeah. Chris, you want the last word on this? Boy, do I. (laughs) Um, So (laughs) I'm I'm 
bullish on the idea, but I also think that the whole concept is that, all right, so so you're talking to a bunch of people who have, you know, we can command a stage wherever that's part of what we do. We get a, you know, an opportunity to go and speak. What I see so far, for, I'm on the outside because I'm an Android guy and those people, even though there's, you know, what's it, 70% Android to 30% iOS, they're not invited to Clubhouse or Twitter spaces or anywhere. Um, on the outside, what I see is that it's a great place for, well, so fancy people can show up and like, you know, excite the, you know, the peasants. But then what also happens is that peasants can go in there and be like, I'm important. And, you know, sometimes it, it sticks for a minute. What I'd rather see, or what I think the benefit's going to be, are small community rooms where it's at least just a little bit, you know, tight. It's a little bit like, you know, sort of what Darren said, but it's that opportunity to get like a half dozen or a dozen people together and have a cool, let's talk about this for a minute kind of moment. Not the not the, the unwashed masses, but also not just the fancy people you'd see on stage. I would love to talk to a whole bunch of like up and comers who are doing really cool, neat things but like a dozen, not, mm. not like the masses. So I don't know. I, the, the live part is marginally interesting in so far as, you know, I'm a big fan of asynchronous, even though I do a live video show every day at 10 a.m. Eastern. But I think that there's a news wise, I think there's something to it. We should keep following it for a little bit longer, but we'll see. Mm. Here's another thing that was interesting to me was the return of civility to a social online environment, because Anyone will type any sort of trash at you, right? I mean, we we know that for sure. But what they've found so far with Clubhouse is that people, when they have to speak to a room of other people who can speak, uh, unlike that guy, I don't know if you saw the video going around about the guy who told the, the other guy who was complaining about the way his son felt to, that why did he leave Mexico? Ooh. Anyway, uh, that's a diversion. Um but yeah, but but generally people won't say stuff like that out loud. Mm. And uh, that's interesting. Maybe it'll last. Maybe we'll just, you know, spiral into a whole new level of terrible, like, you know, Congress. <laughs> All right. Let's go to our third headline, guys. This comes from a tweet from Brandon Hufford, who said the following. He said, I can't stop thinking about the build in public mantra. It seems right now to be heavily influenced by survivorship bias, like so many other things that don't work for most people. Two points I'm considering. One, it takes time away from actually building. If you have four kids and limited time, should you focus on making the thing versus talking about it? And two, when things aren't going well, the build in public flywheel spins the wrong way, causing many to quit. Thinking emoji. So Brian, go to you first on this. Why did this catch your eye? Well, it brings to mind... um, Again, uh, younger people may not remember that Rand Fishkin of, of SEO Moz at the time, now Moz, is the first person I credit with really being radically transparent about everything over there at that business, uh, financials, et cetera. And then I saw Buffer do the same thing, and it worked phenomenally well for them because it's really marketing when you when you think about it, but it's a form of bringing you inside that kind of captivates people. And and Brendan's right. As long as things are going well, it's fantastic. Um, But you got to figure that when things go really badly, people are going to stop talking altogether about it. But um, it's interesting. I was reading uh, an article about trends for this decade and, and this kind of radical transparency is a broader trend uh, with larger companies, uh, not just little guys like us, um, which is interesting because, again, this, I think correctly, this goes back more than a decade when when people started doing this. Uh, perhaps it's just gaining momentum. So it can work. Um, I do. I won't name names, but there were some companies who did it, who, and it just came across as cringy bragging. It was terrible. I guess they were doing too well if there's such a thing where it stopped being interesting. And I was just like, okay, you're doing great. Shut up. I don't want to hear about it. (laughs) (laughs) Chris, you're nodding there. What are your thoughts on it? Anytime fancy people want to talk about how great they are, it doesn't really light anybody up. I mean, no one like goes, wow, I feel so motivated now that a rich person's richer, but (laughs) you know, um, 
I've, I've not really understood how not to be the way I am. Like I tell everybody when things are bad or when things are good and have for decades, like, it's just how I am. Hey, Chris, how's it going? I don't know. I'm not making any money these days, you know, and I'll just say it. And then people are like, Oh, or other times I get shot out of the air because you know, the first, I did the first Google plus uh, business webinar and I forget what I charged, but people lost their minds. Like, Oh my gosh, he's going to make like a hundred grand to teach people Google plus. It just came out four days ago. He's an idiot. And I was like, I am. If I get that much money, if every single person buys it, I'll be rich. And of course nobody did. I mean, like enough people bought it. I mean, like, I don't know, 14 grand for a webinar, which isn't the worst, but you know, the, the numbers thing, like Pat Flynn at smart passive doing it. And, um, um, uh, uh, why am I not thinking of his name? Uh, entrepreneur and fi- John Lee Dumas, uh, learning it from Pat. All these people doing it and showing like what they make and whatever. I always do that. I always tell people, you know, what I charge for speeches. And I always tell people when things are crap. I, I think it's what Brian just said is the most interesting. Like when big companies start doing this, whoa, this is in our best year. Like that would be amazing. Like that, I would love like, I don't know, Coke to be like, man, you guys really don't want soda pop anymore. <laughs> You really like water. <laughs> I better go find some more water companies. That would be amazing to watch. But I don't I, publicly traded companies. There's some dangers to that. Like you can't say certain things and whatever. That's and true. It's another whole mess. But boy, I, I think I always have shown the negative parts of the journey because I don't ever want people to realize that you always fall in holes. Like when you don't like find that hockey stick, hit the hockey stick and suddenly you have the money for the rest of your life and you're dead. You can still fall in holes. Like you could be a guy like me that invested it all back into stuff and failed almost every investment, you know? So I think it's important that we keep shining the light on the holes in the ground as well as the ladders that get you back out. Yeah. Darren, do you want to have the last word on this? Are you there? I we might have quit the show. He's we, done. we might have temporarily lost Aaron. That's okay. We'll get him back. We will get him back. All right. In the meantime, that is going to conclude this week's edition of Headlines, and that means that it is time for this week's main topic. So, on February fourth, Justin Jackson, one of the founders of the podcast hosting company Transistor FM, which we actually use to host our private unemployable initiative podcast feeds tweeted the following. He said, newsletters, blogs, podcasts, the classic internet is back in style. A mindful, slow pace, less frenzy. Feels good. I know that I speak for many when I say, you're darn right it does. And the three people that are here on the show today were pioneers of the classic internet that Justin is referring to. So let's talk about what's new, what's different, and what is the same as it ever was. Brian, I will turn it over to you. Well, Chris and I uh, did a podcast together, like impromptu, just last week uh, for Search Engine Journal. So we got to catch up a little and chat. Um, but one thing, even though what, that was an SEO show, we came back and, and spoke about the one medium that never went anywhere, but was you know declared dead 15 times uh, before 2010 alone, and that's email. So, Chris, why don't you share a little bit of, of the take you had, whether you remember it or not, just hold court on email for us. <laughs> I was like, you want me to remember a day and a half ago? Uh, <laughs> you, you know what I do in my quarantine? Um, e- email's alive and well. I started a list, I think around 2009 or so, which was long after I was the Chris Brogan. Like if I had done this way sooner, back when I was blogging in 98, when I started to feel like I almost got the hang of it around 2005, 2006, I would have been so much further ahead, but I waited because I said, well, you know, who needs email? There's blogs until you learn and get the value of email and you realize it's a very lean forward technology and it's an incredibly easy delivery mechanism uh, and that you can totally crush other people and squeeze the will out of them uh, by how great you could be with email. Because the only thing you have to do in email to win over everybody else is be super personable, make it read like it comes from a human being, and give people a reason to hit reply sometimes in between the reason to buy. If you, if you, my, my premise has always been you should always at least reply, and sometimes I'll ask you to buy. And so that's how I've been running email since 2009. It uh, has accounted for 70 plus percent of my revenue for many, many, many years. It'd be a little less this year, but only because I got some pretty decent gigs outside of email for once. But it's email marketing 
email newsletters, email everything is still the bearing tool that I think runs the business. And I think it's just such a great opportunity. That's why we need things like blogs or video shows or podcasts though, because we have to earn the right to sell and serve and get people on the list. So that's why I do those other things is so people will come back to my secret email layer. That's yeah, it. absolutely. I am much more Chris Brogan ish these days with email and hit reply and tell me what you think. Um, during the height of copy blogger, we were very broadcast oriented, but it worked. So, um, and, and I always refer to that as kind of brute strength authority. I mean, we had a giant list. We had a, you know, we got a bigger customer list than most people have email lists. So it was, you know, in our little case, uh, a, a scale in the sense that there were enough people to pay attention, even though I wasn't being as personable. Sonia always did a great job of it. Um, but after a while, getting thousands of replies can be very difficult to process. Um, with smaller lists that are highly engaged, I love when people rely, I mean, reply to me and, and tell me just such valuable stuff. Plus, I get to talk to them, which is cool. So it, it's been nice. Um, there was one moment um, back at the time that copy bloggers started and, and blogging was all the rage and RSS just made so much sense. You know, it's logical that you would want all the control and take that away from the publisher with RSS, you know, you join a feed, but if you decide to leave, that is 100% in your control. Um, that's how it's supposed to work with email, of course. Um, but if you unsubscribe and, they're like, yeah, we'll take you off the list in 10 days. Really? You know, I, I love when you get those messages from big companies. I'm like, you probably have seriously sophisticated marketing automation and you can't take me off the list for 10 days. Right. That's probably the law, I guess. That's uh can spam. You know, they're just going to go with that. Ridiculous. Anyway, but, um, but, you know, this is just a lesson that what's best logically for the consumer, for the end user, does not mean they're going to take it. And RSS was ultimately a geeky thing until it powered podcasts and no one knows it's there, right? You don't have to know what that means. You don't have to know who Dave Weiner was or is, you know, and that's how technology has to be to get mass adoption. It's underneath the hood, not the thing, you know, on top of it. And plus everyone uses email for work, for family, for everything. It just can't go away, even if sometimes we might wish it would. Darren, any thoughts? I missed the question. <laughs> Yay, he's back. That's all I care about. <laughs> I, I now, now have microphone, but I don't yeah, know what so you're the question, about. <laughs> the question was the continued uh, power of email all these many years later, it's still, you know, the number one conversion channel for sales. It, it's, it's where you have to point people, whether you're blogging, podcasting, or you're, you're just right there with email to begin with. Um, what's been your experience? I was just talking about how I thought for a brief moment, RSS might take over, but it just mm -hmm. didn't because it's too geeky. Yeah, look, I think email is still king for us on both my sites, uh, but it's harder than ever before, uh, I, I find, in terms of, I mentioned it earlier, you know, Gmail filtering things and putting them in promotion tabs and that. So you there's a lot more roadblocks there, and we used to always say email is something you control. <laughs> It's not really. There's there's um, there's things in between you and email, and all the new email services that are coming out are building in these things to not interrupt people with promotional messages. So, you know, there's a real art in writing an email that's going to get through and be read by people. Um, and and I guess really, it's it, the lesson there with. Email is the same as with blogging and podcasting. If it's useful, if it's engaging, people will look for it and that's a signal to Gmail that they need to present it more. So, yeah, there's some challenges there, but it's a real art, I think. Yeah, and that, that's why I argue that email has to be the thing, you know, not a 
you know, not a blog with a lead magnet to get on a list when they're really just trying to get the thing and they're not going to pay attention. The goodness has to be in the email. And, uh, you know, it, it's tricky, but w- you don't stick around as long as we have and <laughs> without adaptability. So, well, that's a nice segue, Darren, into uh, blogging and how would you characterize? I know we we did inter- our last interview together was basically about, you know, is blogging making a comeback? And frankly, it's never left. Uh, we may not call it blogging necessarily, um, but the idea of, you know, using WordPress to publish articles is not really radically different. So what's your take? Yeah. So, I mean, when we all started, it was all text. We defined a blog and I remember there was huge art- uh, arguments about what is a blog. <laughs> and I think most people said chronological content, usually with comments. I mean, that could describe Instagram. It could describe Twitter. It could describe Facebook. Like, you know, most of the social networks, the traditional social networks have that blogging sort of form to it today. And if you look at most blogs written on WordPress, there's images, there's video, there's people doing live videos and embedding them. There's lots of embeds from other social media. So blogging has changed so much, um, but I think it's still um, there. There's been a rebalance between text and and other forms, which is a great thing. Um, But I think it's still completely relevant for people because people are always going to want written content. People from the the age of the printing press has always wanted something to read. Um, and so I think a blog is a great way to to get that out there. But people also want something to listen to. People also want something to watch. So it's not the only way anymore. Um, that what we argue with our students is that your blog is a great place to put all that other stuff because every other place where you can create content, you can embed it. And to be able to have it all in the one place on your blog, in your home base, that term that Chris came up with years years ago, that home base, still relevant today, um, being able to have that and embed it all into that one place so people can find everything you do, I think is is where I think a blog is at today. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, if you want traffic from Google, um, it's kind of imperative. I've kind of downplayed uh, the role of SEO in the last few years because, again, I went newsletter first. It's not that I don't get traffic from Google. I don't optimize for it. Um, and the, and the thing, the reason why, um, and that's not a perpetual thing because both with unemployable and further, um, I will be producing new original content and will of course be thinking in terms of, uh, you know, what people are searching for and whatnot. But my thing was at the beginning of a new project, let's say you're going to start a new blog. You don't really know. Um, who you, you know what your topic is, but you don't necessarily know who is going to show up, who your ideal prospect is. You kind of discover that over time. I mean, you can, you can aim to attract a certain type of person, uh, but until they show up, you don't know for certain. What do you give uh, as advice to starting bloggers about trying to understand who they're trying to reach? We'll go with Chris on that one. Well, I believe I could speak for Darren when I say. <laughs> yeah, what would Darren say <laughs> if, if he weren't kicked off the internet? <laughs> Darren would say, crikey, now that's a big crocodile. Good day, mate. You, got, you know the secret to saying mate correctly with an Australian accent? You actually say might, M-I-G-H-T. Take take what you will with that. Good to know. <laughs> Fun fact: while we have technical difficulties, da, da, uh, da, da, da. <laughs> blogging in in the civilized part of the world where we can all talk and like <laughs> the devices work. Uh, the thing I still like about blogging, I haven't been blogging as much on chrisbrogan.com, partly because I'm going through some SEO fixes from years and years of having a blog. It's almost like when you like finally bust your ACL and the doctor has to like go in and mess with your knees a little bit. And then they're like, uh, you probably ought to do something with your hip while we're here. And you're like, what are you talking about? Well, listen up, old man. So anyway, my blog's uh, getting tidied is what I've been told by the best SEOs in the world. But one of the things that uh, <laughs> I feel about the land of, 
uh, blogging is that what I still get to do there is I still get to write my story my way. I get to be myself as the publishing house. I get to say, you know, this part probably makes a little more sense in video. Watch this video I shot for you. And then there's a video tapped into that. Think about a book. A book is what it is. You know, it can be also an audio book. You can also spread it into other things. But a blog post can be video, audio, text, you know, everything. It can be photos. And I, and I still love that fact. I still love the fact that the format allows us to create insanely good function. So that's probably what Darren Rouse would say, except he'd also say something about how people are generally nice and kind and really deserve a better life. Maybe in Australia. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Cynic just showed up. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Chris, I mean, we've talked about this in the past that sometimes you have an audience and it turns out they're interested in you and what you have to say, but they may not be interested in what you have to sell. And I'm a big you know, proponent, obviously, of listening very carefully um, to what their pain points are. So that you create something that you're you're reasonably sure that they want to buy. Um, any other alternative to that approach? Um, you know that you can always go with that mindset that sometimes people don't know what they want, and sometimes we have to give them the serving suggestion first um, as as a, like a, a little kickoff project. One thing that can often work. A lot of times, people have this thing about I want to do something, but I don't know what the thing is. And I always say, launch something then. Launch something that's even, you know, ostensibly stupid or not enough people buy it or like four people buy this thing you were hoping 50 would buy and then learn from that and say, okay, well, let's work through this anyway. And this is what we're going to do. And I'm going to treat this as if, and then, you know, you can almost always get to something out of a a launch where there's not enough people, or you can almost get something out of trying something new and small first. I think that, you know, if if you look at uh, test kitchens or pop-ups or uh, sometimes even other collabs, you know, make fun of them all you want. When Kanye West said, I think I'm going to get involved in fashion. The first thing he did is he started doing little pokes around other people's stuff. And he like let people, you know, guide him and all that. And he launched a shoe company that made pretty okay dough. So like, I don't think, I think that if you're willing to get mocked halfway there, then you can really open up even more opportunities and even more experiences. So, uh, you know, I think, yes, it's, it's the best to listen to people. Another way to get there is to launch something and see what happens and see what you can triangulate back out from it. Yeah, absolutely. We've launched several things uh, that didn't exist yet. And if people weren't interested, we just wouldn't have made it. (laughs) You can do that with courses and, you know, other digital stuff, Uh, not so much with software. So that was uh, more the minimum viable product approach where you're like, yeah, here's something that kind of works. What do you think? (laughs) Um, but you said something important, and it uh, echoes a famous Steve Jobs quote, which is the consumer. It's not the consumer's job to know what they want. It's your job as an entrepreneur. But you can pay attention to where they're hurting or desiring. And, and then you craft a solution that at least satisfies that. Uh, and you're right. They, often, they don't know that that's the thing they needed, but they, it clicks with them once they see it. And I think that's a perfect segue to the next question for you, Chris, which is what the heck are you doing with the backpack show? Oh, this is the best stupid idea I've ever had in a long, long time. (laughs) This is so great. So right at the very beginning of quarantine, I I said, well, I guess I'm not going to be on any stages for a while. Better do something. So I launched a a show that I was calling point of contact. And the way I got the name was I, I asked Google voice. I said, Hey, Google, What's the opposite of isolation? And they said, contact. I said, okay, good enough. Point of contact. So I launch it. Uh, And it's just basically a show. The first few shows were like me trying to figure out how to use a slow cooker to do a pot roast. Came out great. Um, The next show set I did from that was I, I, I prettied it up a little. And I called it the catch up show. And I had graphics made. And people were like, oh, this is funny. He must really take it serious. There's graphics. I then asked Carrie Gorgon, I said, hey, do you want to come on my show and work with me on it? And she was like, yeah. I said, I don't have any money, but like, do you want to just come be on it? She's like, yeah, okay. And then on the first day, I said, oh, you should also be the co-host. Oh, okay. And then she went and got a few extra things, and then she was the co-host. And so she very quickly became showrunner with me. 
And we launched a show called The Backpack Show that has two or three guests every given day, occasionally one, every weekday, 10 a.m. Eastern. Uh, it's a business show where we're, we're looking for business insights and success insights from unusual places. So that's uh, Mexican comedy horror actors. It's Sir Mix-a-Lot. It's Sister Anne Flanagan of the Daughters of St. Paul. It's adult film star Kelly Shibari. So it's it's a mix of people. Um, we had a few rules going into it is almost no marketing turd heads. So like all my normal friends that I know and would love to have on the show, none of them are invited. Brian, you're not but- invited. Thanks, uh, no bud. white guys as much as we can help it. So you're also not invited. Uh, and uh, no white straight guys. So there are three strikes. You're all out. So we have a lot of people of color on the show. Uh, we have a lot of uh, people from all different kinds of uh, walks of life, different sexual preferences and genders. Uh, we, we, we introduced, uh, sorry, interviewed a documentary person who is a furry who did a documentary on the furry community. And until that point, I only knew like furry jokes. Like I only knew like things that you did to mock them. But when you find out that that's a massive ecosystem of multiple six figure earners helping each other, like a very closed ecosystem where multiple people are making six figures because furries are all original characters. They're not paying and getting in trouble with people like Warner Brothers or somebody for using their stuff and showing their fandom and getting sued for it. So that's what we found. So the show has been the best thing I've ever done. There's no viable business reason to run the show. We get just (laughs) that much sponsorship. And someday I'll get a little bit more. uh, So I can actually even pay a salary to carry. But along the way, it's been the most rewarding thing. Meeting all kinds of people I didn't know. uh, Talking to people about important stuff all the time. Not always super heavy serious. But always with the mindset of people that I wasn't hanging out with as often. And so it's just been a... It's beauty of a product. And uh, the show is live. It goes out to Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Twitch, and LinkedIn. Uh, the <laughs> LinkedIn Live, we had a sex therapist on the show for our first ever LinkedIn Live show. I thought, well, here comes our last LinkedIn Live show. But <laughs> somebody wrote a really nice post saying, uh, you know, I just watched a sex therapist on a LinkedIn Live show, and I'm here for it. And I was like, yes. And then um, the only other thing to say is that we even we made an audio podcast version in it almost works because occasionally there's visual stuff and we can't really translate that well, but why not? We thought let's launch another podcast. The kid founded pod camp. Maybe we give him a podcast. That's it. Show's great. I love it. It's one of my best things I do in my life. Sounds awesome. Right. Um, Every time I think of the backpack show, do you, did you see the movie with George Clooney up in the air? I did. Yes. Yeah. What's in your backpack. And he would give those seminars and, (laughs) I don't know why. I just, so you got you got to have George Clooney on the show is what I'm saying. You know, after landing like Sir mix and landing like a five-time beatbox champion, Butterscotch, uh, uh, Lawrence Lessig, we've had names on there that just shouldn't be guests with us. So we never, ever count anybody out. We just think, how the heck can we actually get access to this person? And that's hmm. all we do. We just go looking for those people. Nice. 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 If all right. If we were a black woman, it would be easier, though. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I hear Robert Downey Jr. could accommodate you, but not George. Mm. Tropic Thunder joke. Come on, people. <laughs> what do you mean by you people and all that? I'm gonna... <laughs> right. um, that was funny. Obama's speechwriter, David Litt. We had uh, Scottish comedian Janie Godley. She, she's almost harder to understand than Rouse. <laughs> hey. ah. Calm down. That was just a test. That was just a test to see if you were there, Darren. I mean, you know, I don't. The worst thing you can ever do is go. Let's kick it over to Darren. Darren. <laughs> yeah, Darren, who's uh, now got three cameras and four microphones all running at once, and I'm not sure what's actually creating this audio. <laughs> <laughs> Something is. That's all we care about. That that is awesome. So. All right, let's get down to some serious reminiscing. And it, it's been 12, almost 13 years since we did that third tribe thing. I don't even know. I mean, there were always membership sites and, and community forums and whatnot. Um, so there had to be other virtual communities at the time, or how else would we think about it? But uh, that was a cool thing. Darren, what do you remember about that time? Because, you know... We're all getting older, so it may take all three of us to piece it together. Well, what stands out for me of those times was the um, 
the idea that a community of people was were learning together and sharing what they were learning um, really generously. I, I know there was snark and there was competition as well, but we started Third Tribe because we wanted to do something different to that sort of internet marketer, um, slimy kind of stuff that was going on and still going on, I guess, to some degree today. And this community that came together to do something that was very transparent, but very for the good of all. Um, yeah, it was it was interesting to watch people experimenting in public um, and to talk about their failures as well as their successes. Um yeah, I think it was a really special vibe and uh, um, it's amazing how many people still contact me from time to time. I was in Third Tribe and it, it kicked off this whole new direction of, of what I was doing in terms of internet marketing. So, yeah, it's it was a wonderful thing to be a part of and I think a really great, great reaction to some of the sort of more negative stuff that was happening in internet marketing at the time, some of that slimy behaviour. Yeah, I guess I should explain uh, the name, Third Tribe, was meant to signify uh, people who came from the blogging world, which was very idealistic and kumbaya and whatnot. And then there, you know, and I'm teaching people direct response copy, which comes more from the internet marketing side, which some people were ethically challenged. I think we covered this last time when I made sure to, to say that Ryan Dice was always on the right side of the line, in my opinion. Um, so our idea, uh, and I think Sonia and I actually, I think Sonia, um, came up with the actual brand, but the idea was there's a third group of people who wanted to, to put together the best of both worlds, to take the highly ethical, high value delivery of the blogging world uh, and learn actually how to sell stuff. Imagine that. So, yeah, Darren, when you say a little bit of, of the internet marketing uh, sleazy side is still around, everyone, when I tell stories about how it was in the early days of blogging and that people didn't like me talking about selling with blogs, they're like, you're kidding. Because yeah. now everyone's like, how quickly can I sell this person some, something? You know, it's almost gone too far. We could, we could use a little bit more of that idealism and, and emphasis on value, uh, I think. But, you know, everyone will figure it out for themselves because ultimately the public out there is no more trusting than they were back in 2008. In fact, they're less. So you got to work for that trust. It's, uh, it's tough. And Chris, this is the, uh, the New York Times bestselling author of trust agents, Chris Brogan, Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Um, listen, I have a different memory of how this started, which was that, um, and you know, I am also Irish, so I am a I'm a natural born thief of stories, and I'm also an author, so I also steal stories. I remember this as being some conversation you had with Godin about, you know, on one side there's Kumbaya, and on the other side there's like the Dan Kennedys of the world. And, you know, you know, Godin said something like, well, you got to pick one. You got to, which one, which tribe are you in? This tribe or that tribe? And you said, I'm in the third tribe. That's the way I remembered this all starting. Was a That did tribe. happen. Wow. I, I totally forgot that. That's amazing. That's for, how I tell it anyway. Could for be an Irish drunk, you have an amazing memory. It could be fake. That's what I'm saying. I mean, that's how No, I no, it, it. it happened. Yeah, I did not remember that until just now. Um, that's, at least I gave Sonia credit. But yeah, that was very, it. Sonia deserves all the credit she gets and then some, even if she did. Absolutely. Didn't. Yeah. Sonia, Seth, Simon. Same thing. Yeah. I remember, you know, because, of course, Godin was the reason I got on the right path in 99 in the first place. By the time Sonia showed up in 2007 as a teaching sales customer, and then she became, a, you know, the editor of the blog, then she became a business partner. And, you know, her, her blog, Remarkable Communication, which she has reinvigorated uh, after um, getting bought out of, of Copyblogger. You know, but I, I kind of gave her a little elbow in the ribs and said, look, that's a shrine to Seth Godin. Who are you? Who are, You need to stand on your own two feet. And she always brings that up as both kind of bitter, a bitter pill, but what she needed to hear. We all need to hear that we don't need to hero worship. My new partner in Copyblogger, Tim, 
oh, he's such a fanboy, and he'll, he'll occasionally slip back into it. And I'm like, Tim, if you keep doing that, I'm not talking to you. I mean, I can't stand it. <laughs> so he got over it. Now he's mean to me, which I, I don't think I was going for that. But <laughs> I think it's, a, it's just a lesson. We all have heroes. Uh, and you can learn from everyone, but then ultimately you got to figure out who am I? Um, and, uh, someone in the live audience, Claire Emerson is a great example who has made that transition. And now she's just Claire. She stands right. for who she is. Right. And I love it. That's awesome. I also said in the chat that, you know, boy, oh boy. One thing I remember about third tribe were those checks. Holy cow. <laughs> I made a bag of money. So then I thought, well, this is all you have to do is stand up a a community platform and everyone's going to come and they'll just give you tons of money. And I was like, this is great. I changed my entire business around to make multiple little community platforms. Failed again. I did not get the bags of money. So thanks, Third Tribe. It was the the project for the moment. Um, Yeah, we we did took the lead, take the lead on it and produced it and but, you know, without Chris and Darren, it wouldn't have been the same thing. And I love the congruency between the three, you know, amigos and uh, third tribe kind of thing. So it was, uh, I don't know, it just worked. It was the right thing at the right time. I don't think it could work today because everyone basically melds uh, the worlds together. And like I said, you know, swinging may be too far away from some of the more uh, idealistic things that we, we still embrace. Our hair is not green enough. I don't know. Huh? Our hair is not green enough. We can't do anything important anymore. Your hair is incredible. It's lustrous. (laughs) (laughs) I tried to very jealous. I'm very jealous. Yeah. Darren, don't, don't make Darren feel bad over here. Sorry, Darren. <laughs> yeah, I went with the long hair a few years ago, and that was my last hurrah. I'm like, that was a bad idea. You look like the assistant roadie to the assistant roadie for the Grateful Dead, and you need to not. Don't you do know that. what? Okay. One great thing about the tribe, too. One last thing I will say that I, that I mean a little more earnestly, I, although I do mean that the checks were nice. Uh, the one thing I'll say about it was, man, we met so many great people. It was one of those great communities where the audience and the people who consider themselves members were just as capable and many more ideas than we even had. And we could always learn from it. And that's not everyone's even sitting around and getting ready to be in that mindset. Nobody's ready to be that kind of environment. And that was, that was I feel, ahead of its time in some ways because there was all these cults of look at me out there. But that was a real like, we're here to talk to each other and I, I chase that still. I chase that feeling of, you know, a, a peer organization of smart superheroes. Mm. All right. Let's get meta here and talk about podcast. Um, we had a recent uh, episode with Jay Akunzo, who's, I don't know if you know him, Chris, um, but he's an incredibly bright guy. He's basically kind of taken, you know, our ideas about making written content engaging from the early days and he does that with audio, very much the media, not marketing kind of approach, which is, you know, has become a, a thing, uh, probably my best catch, catchphrase. Um, but I think the, the takeaway for me, unless you're, you know, let's see, Pat Flynn's probably the best example of someone who just started out the gate with a podcast and blew up really big. As you mentioned, John Lee Dumas kind of, followed that path a little exactly, you know, you've got your Tim Ferriss, you've got your Joe Rogan, you know, podcast first, I guess. But for most of us mere mortals, the podcast is just part of our mix, but it's an important one because it's where people get to hear us. Um, It's just a more intimate medium. How do you, you know, Chris, you're now with backpack, you've got video and audio first and foremost. Is it, the thing or is it still a part of an overall mix? It sounds like it is. I mean, so you can always use any of the tools, right? You can always, wherever you think you're going to have a great time. That's great. One reason I went to video instead of audio was that there's a lot fewer people commuting during the apocalypse. And so if you're not commuting during the apocalypse, you're not necessarily thinking of what you're going to listen to while you're driving to work. 
you may or may not think about that when you're taking the dog out or pushing the baby around or down some stairs or whatever you do with babies. Um, but oh. I thought, well, there's a lot of people looking at video. And so I might as well do a video show. It's not just so I can show off my hair. I mean, that's a given. But what I thought was that if I did a video show, at least there's some motion, you know, when you can do some production, when you can wiggle the screens a little bit and make it look like a show, then people will pay a little attention for a minute. And so um, I think that there's a great value in video right now. And there'll be more because self-driving cars, uh, you know, all these vehicles, more and more are coming up with these. We're going to drive around for you. Don't even worry about it. Sit in the back. Who cares? Um, I think as you're crashing into another vehicle because the robot didn't know what to do, I want you to see me on the backpack show right before you hit that other car. Huh. Before we kick it over to Darren to, to see what he says, um, tell quickly about the platform you use to oh. do the backpack show. Because he did a little demo, Jared, for me. It's pretty cool yeah. what you yeah, can Jared, do. Jared, come by and you can see it as well. Um, okay. Yeah. Because we both know that Brian just saw it like, you know, a dog looking at a sandwich, but you've got to look at it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, he's like, wow, that sandwich looks delicious, Chris. And you're like, How, what's in that sandwich anyway? And I'm like, well. Hey, you need to talk to Jared so he can make me that sandwich is basically <laughs> right. what I said. So I used a platform called StreamYard. I had no interest mm. in using the platform. I'm super friendly with Ecamm Live guys. They, they live and work in the town I live in. It's a very small town for us to both look at each other across the way, and I'm using a competing platform. But Kerry Gargone, my co-host, who is so much smarter than me, said, just try it. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to try it because I'm that guy now. With I have a white beard. I can say no all day, Jared. And so she goes, come on, try it anyway. We try it, and it is a showrunner's kind of software. It's everything I asked the boys to make, and they didn't yet. Mm. which is like can i switch cameras can i do one big camera can i do lots of little guys can i bring in video clips can i bring in full pages and show people the site all like a show oh. and when you know i can stream it to a bunch of places i can manage all the uh, comments coming up and down i can manage all the banners i do it poorly compared to carrie but i can i've done it and um the other thing is that when you're done you're done the live show is in the can uh it's gone to all the places it's going to go to plus you get to keep a copy um, I could push one little button and also just grab an MP3 to make it into a, a podcast. So it's so click and done. It's just done. So, you're, you're not. You're not the second person that's told me about this, and it's. Well, it sounds fantastic. I've, I've got to use it. Yard, bitch. Just like there you go. I'll make six dollars <laughs> and twenty one cents if you click that. Stream so streamyard. Okay, Stream I'm gonna have to try this because that that sounds like everything that I've kind of duct taped together with a bunch of different softwares. To do live and, shows. And what you're doing is clever, and I love it. And I especially love your soundboard. They don't have a soundboard; they have a video board. Um, I'm a little surprised that they don't expect. Yeah, but a it. video board would be that would be so helpful. I was just working just last week. I was working with OBS to try to yeah. integrate OBS with Zoom to do some different titling and things like that. And it's just it's complicated. So this sounds yeah, great. All right. OBS needs an OBS one can OBS. That's for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the recommendation on that. My pleasure. All right. I have to admit that I'm a dedicated reader and I produce podcasts, but I don't listen to them. Darren, are you still doing the Pro Blogger podcast? We're not doing it at the moment. I haven't done it for over a year and a half. And the reason was that I kind of ran out of things to talk about. My my podcast was very how-to um, and, and, you know, we kind of worked through pretty much everything that we teach in, in blogging. Um, and it did really well and it continues to get a lot of listens. It drove a lot of people to our events, which was a real surprise to me. Most of the people who came to our events were coming from the podcast, not from the blog. Um, that hasn't really helped this year, um, I have to say, because we're not doing the events anymore. Uh, but what we've actually done is taken the audio from the podcast and put slides on it, and now we're selling it as our courses. So we're actually repurposing our podcast into a paid product, and people are loving that. Um, and so it, it's still paying off in in different ways. I went to live video. For me, live video, as as Chris has said, allowed me to do so much more. And for me, it's it's about the comments and the interaction. What I learned is that most of our readers, once they've got the theory, they want to then ask questions about how to apply it into their situation. So um, that live interaction is is definitely where it's at. And for me, it's as as intimate, if not more intimate, than the podcast um, in, in lots of ways, and that people can see, they can experience who I am, but also I can show them 
you know, what I'm doing on a screen as well. And so we're using a lot of that. We do use Ecamm Live um, and it's got a lot of these days, a lot of that same functionality to be able to, um, you know, bring in websites and multiple cameras and all of that type of thing. Um, they're continuing to develop it. So, yeah, it's it's fascinating to be in that live space. In terms of consuming content, I'm spending a lot more time in live video as well. I'm, I'm spending a lot of time on Twitch, um, which Interesting. is fascinating. It's a whole other world and they're doing live video like I've never seen it before um, as well. A lot of them using the Ecamm Live, live on the OBS type stuff as well um, and, and monetizing while they're doing it which is, hmm. is great too. Yeah. It just seems like we're inching bit by bit towards these more uh, rich, interactive, almost as real world as you can get with the current technology. Um, that's where the people who are into you the most want to go. I am not surprised at all that you were getting more conference registrations from your podcast because it's an absolute more personal and intimate experience than reading a blog post, but without the blog post, they may not find the podcast or the video or the live stream in the first place. So yeah, yeah I think it's, it, it's, it's definitely a mix. Um, and I think having that written content there is certainly great for that first time visitor who comes in. It's also really shareable. Um, and the podcast cannot compete with SEO or, or the shareable content, but um, yeah, and then having something to push people towards that builds that relationship is is just so um, so important. And uh, yeah, it's it's where it's at. I think for me. Hmm. Okay, final thing because this has been fantastic, and uh, we don't want to go to Tim Ferriss length here. So, uh, quick one. Last week, at the end of the week, the hustle was acquired by HubSpot. This is a media company that was built by a curated email newsletter, which we are very bullish about here at Unemployable and Seven Figure Small. Remember the link post? That was the original version of curation back in the day, right? And uh, bloggers, copy blogger got millions of links, I think, pro pro blogger too, I'm sure, Chris Mm -hmm. too. Uh, Because our audience did include bloggers and they needed to put something out there. And often it was, you know, a link to whatever was cool at the time. Um, And yet curation now is a very sophisticated, almost news reporting, but also in my mind, a very persuasive medium because you're like, it's not just me saying this. Look, these people are saying this too kind of thing. Quick thoughts on this before we let you go. I think it's it's uh, an incredible skill um, that not everyone has um, to to have the time to be across all of the different stuff. And I think curation today is in um, we're in need of good curators more than we've ever needed them before because there's just so much content being created. I'm I've just gotten into a really new niche keyboard mechanical keyboards lately, um, and it's a tiny tiny niche. Um, there's, there can't be too many people in the world doing it, but there's so much content being created every day in this tiny little niche. And in that niche, there's already curators. There's already people doing live streams saying, this keyboard just got released. This person's just done this video. And it's so useful. Um, I'm drawn to that. I learn from it. Um, and the people who are doing the curation don't always know, they're not at the expert level, but their their brand is growing as a result of it. And uh, I just think it's a great way to start out. Um, and it's, it's something that can really build your credibility and profile uh, in a niche. Yeah. It's like a better value proposition. If no one knows who you are, you can't, here's an article I wrote, big deal, you know, every week, or I'll find the best stuff for you because you don't have time to in this particular area. Darren, I'm reminded of your initial photography blog way back before Pro Blogger and, of course, before Digital Photography School. But you curated uh, camera rec- and gear recommendations, right? You know, as an totally. Amazon affiliate. And that's, you know, the wire cutter sold for $30 million. So, if, you know, that kind of curation has grown up. Uh, as well. So, and, and yet, I guess going back to the theme, 
of you know the classical internet what's working now is is a different form but still the same as what worked before it's just you know new people don't realize what happened you know five years ago much less 15 so chris what are your thoughts you know what it made me think of so i'm envious and also good for the hustle but what it made me think is that there was this mad wave when this happened, like when TechCrunch gets acquired by AOL and all these other places, you know, got acquired. Uh, what was that? 2006, 2007 or so. All these blogs got bought up because all of a sudden people went, whoa, we need these media properties. And they grabbed them. And I, I think it's great that there's newsletters out there getting that kind of scratch. And it really makes me wish that I had put together something just really consistent and niche that would be so obvious for some industry to have wanted to buy because my newsletter, no one's going to acquire that. It's a bunch of weird ramblings from an old dude. I got to make a new one and start it and hope that I can catch up to all these guys if I want to do that kind of business. But what I think is that if you look at that, that's really saying some interesting stuff. The kings of inbound marketing said, hey, email really has a value. We're going to put a massive amount of money in these people's hand because they went out and did the oldest shit on the internet, acquired a list. They got a list. And they're going to monetize the list. Dan Kennedy teaches you that. You know, he teaches you that in books where it's still like electronic mail, right? So like it's everything old is new again and everybody old is, you know, maybe we should all make our hair purple and start again. But it, it's, it's definitely this uh, great opportunity if, and I like your point that like a, a relative nobody could really still have a game in this for sure. And I think that's important because it, it's really for facility, right? It's usefulness. If I can, if I can grab a list that gets me into the thing I'm into, by the way, I watch Darren now for mechanical keyboard stuff. I don't own a single mechanical keyboard, but I like when he gets one and I like to look at it and I like to see what he says about it. Oh, that's pretty clever. And every now and again, I get that urge, especially as an author to get one that he got that looks like No, I could probably write a good book with that, which is the dumbest sentence ever written by a human. But I feel it when I look at what Darren's got. So I think there's there's so much value and I think there's such a great opportunity. And I think that, my gosh, you know, the world is beautiful again. Yeah, and that's a good point to kind of wrap this up. It's a very third tribe sentiment because the Internet is a direct medium. Uh, That's what I figured out in 1999 and took off. But... It's direct marketing with a human, authentic voice. And that's what the blogging thing brought to this conversation. Um, Some of the best copywriters out there right now, you don't realize you're being persuaded or sold to because it is so effortless, right? And curation itself is even a persuasion vehicle when done correctly and focusing on the audience, not your desire to get that paper. Paper will come. Jared, I think that's a wrap. Are we done or do we want to do any questions? Oh, we've, we've gone over a little bit, but we can, I know. Remember when we used to do 30 minute podcast? I do. (laughs) I do. (laughs) (laughs) I do. But we want to be respectful of Darren and Chris's time because I know we told you guys an hour, but do you have time to hang around or do we need to let you go? They better be good questions. Oh, well, (laughs) all right. These are very smart people. That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, then let's do it here. Let's kick on some jazz and let's uh and let's let's ask some questions. We had one earlier in the chat that I want to get to here if I can find it. And Chris, you answered it in the chat, but it was a good question. And this is from Jana. So this is in reference to something that you were talking about earlier. She said, "I come from the publishing industry. Uh, the whole uh, reason of publishing is to disseminate ideas. But what constantly amazes me is how little they do what Chris just said: show personality." and build relationships with people, this is what makes me wonder whether individual authors actually need publishers so much anymore. What is your response to that, My take is not so much. I mean, I've done a lot of books. I've done more than half of my books with mainstream, and then I've published some of my own as well. Um, I, I can't really make a great conversation as to why I would need a mainstream publisher. I have access to everything they have access to. I can do my own, my own marketing, usually better than what their choice is going to be. Um, I can get my book into Hudson so that people can see it when they jump on a plane. I have to just pay the money the way they were going to pay the money, you know? So there's almost no real, if you, if you recreate the pieces that publishing houses do well, like have a really great editor, for instance, like you pay for a nice editor and you pay for someone to make a nice index. There's no real reason. The thing is you can't, 
you can't skimp on that stuff and just throw it on the floor. So you have to you have to have a good editor. A poorly edited book is bad manners. And that's like one of the things Darren said about Clubhouse. You wander in there and it's just blather. He really likes a curated podcast. Well, a book better have some grown-ups making it look better. That's that's my only caveat to the I don't need publishers. I need the people who make books better. Mm. Brian? Well, you know, it's a running joke that I've been teaching people to write for 15 years and have probably given away five books worth of stuff, but I've, I'm the only one who hasn't written a book, certainly on this panel, um, other than Jared, of course. But um, yeah, Wait, of course. You know, con- <laughs> <laughs> You're too busy, man. You're too busy. Too busy making me a sandwich. Um <laughs> But, you know, giving away all that material led to an eight-figure business. Now, some authors do that kind of, you know, uh, cheddar, but uh, it's hard to make that much money publishing books. So giving it away, to me, seemed like a better strategy. The only reason I'm contemplating doing one now is because I'm in a different phase of my career. And, you know, if I can kind of make it kind of memoir to a certain degree, you know, that may be fun. So, but you don't need a publisher. Um, I'm just going to probably try to get one just to see, cause it's kind of fun. But uh, mm-hmm. my original idea was to self publish. I got Trudy Roth. Chris knows her. She's my editor and my research assistant. So it could totally be done. Joanna Penn was going to help you know, teach me how to get it up on Amazon and and all that, all the stuff. It's, there's an entire infrastructure now for self-publishing. It's no longer a vanity press. It's real business. It's a real product. If you've got the distribution, uh, which is audience, which is ironically what you get when you give away free content. (laughs) So, you know, it's a very interesting circle of life, but you know, if you're giving away free content and then developing online courses, it's not that different, except you can charge more for courses. Yeah. All right, Darren, did you want to chime in there? Uh, all I really can say is that with our book, the the publisher, all they really did that we couldn't do is get on the ends of the, the rows in Barnes & Noble for a week, um, which certainly helped with distribution and, you know, getting getting it out there to a, an audience beyond ours, and that certainly was great. But um, if you were just starting out and you were, didn't have that audience and you wanted to get a book out quick, then a publisher might be able to help you, you know, to get it out there in front of more people if if you had the right kind of voice. But I think as the other guys have said, it's it's not necessary today. And, and what I did like about the question is that they didn't, re- didn't really – um, promote Chris and myself as a, as um, personal brands at all. It was purely about the book. It wasn't so much about the authors. Um, and, and that, yeah, I think gives you a lot more creative control to do it yourself. Mm-hmm. And the first thing a publisher is going to ask you is, do you have an audience? In fact, you mm-hmm. know, it, it's, it should be in the book proposal because that's what's going to sell it. So really like who needs whom here? You know, I mean, the advice Godin gave me was get the biggest advance you can get. So they'll take the book seriously and they'll do their part. Otherwise you might as well self publish. Makes sense. All right. We have got an audience question. So destiny, uh, I know you want to come on here with audio and I saw you mention earlier that you were with third tribe from the beginning. So yes, yeah, go, go ahead. Ask your question. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Good evening guys. It is really great to meet you all. I'm, not, I'm trying not to go fangirl too much to get Brian uncomfortable. <laughs> but I just wanted to say I've been around for a long time. And my question at this point is, having listened to all that you had to say, do you believe that having changed your various models with time, you are now ser- perhaps serving a different audience? And others are coming in now. And you're at that point of the cycle or we're coming full circle. Do you have, do you plan to go back to that crowd or are you leaving the newcomers behind or should the newcomers come in at where you are now at the entry point? Because I feel that I'm, I'm one can speak for myself, having had a foundation all these years, having grown, uh, having been drawn to the ethical standards, your style that I feel more of that is necessary. So where do you see yourselves? Are you okay where you are? Do you feel obligated to 
meet the newcomers with the old foundation or should they come in now where you're at because we can't go back to where we were so to speak i hope i made sense mm. yes excellent question destiny yeah that that makes sense um and you know with copy blogger now i you know we were five gen x people and we had a largely uh, gen x audience probably my fault because i was making prince metaphors and depeche mode references and didn't even occur to me that I shouldn't do that until one day some guy showed in the comments and he's like, great post. Who's Depeche Mode? Um, but uh, so now Tim, my partner, is a millennial and he is hell bent on, you know, keeping copy bloggers uh, message and integrity the same, but making it relevant to a younger audience. And uh, it's his perspective that's allowing us, I think, to do that. Of course, Stephanie, our editor-in-chief, is also a little bit younger. So that's the only change. It, it requires adjustment. So me making, you know, I, I get to come in and be the old guy founder. And to the limited amount of that I want to do that and do that, it's perfect, Right. Like I'm Dan Kennedy showing up at the AWAI conference now. Uh, well, not anymore, but um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, so it's not the Brian show and it can't be, and I don't want it to be. And that's a good thing. But otherwise, I think you're right. We, you know, the uh, younger people right now face a lot of challenges uh, they may be more willing, even though they're good people, to be a little ethically uh, flexible because they figure that's how the game is played. We have a lot of bad role models in the entrepreneurial community, I think. So it's important to us to say, hey, you know, building trust, doing the right thing with value first and then getting yours after, it works better. Believe it or not, the ruthless business guy approach is to be patient, give more than you take, and you will succeed. And so far, it seems like people are receptive to that message. And that makes me feel good. Mm. Excellent. Chris? Uh, I have a thought or two on that. One is that, Destiny, one thing that's changed or, or that I think has changed is that not necessarily exactly by age, but by new generation of people coming to the space, there's some other opportunities. Like, for instance, there's a lot of people who are leaving their day job behind, uh, either by choice or otherwise, who are suddenly washing up on these shores going, wait a minute, I can do this all by myself. And there's a lot to learn. And I think it was Godin uh, of the Seth Godins. Um, he wrote a few books. He said, uh, it's always September somewhere. Like it's always the first day of school somewhere. And I, I try to work that into my business as often as I can. I never tried, you know, it's something I also stole from uh, comedians. Really good professional comedians tell their joke as if they just thought of it just then. You know, you hear the joke. You maybe have heard that joke 87 times, but they say it like they just made it up. And you go, oh, this is great, right? So I try my best to try to make our content stay as personable as humanly possible and as brand new as humanly possible. And besides having to swap out different technologies that no longer exist, like I can't tell you to jump on Plurk or Jaiku or Pounce, <laughs> <laughs> um, other than that, you know, there are some new things, you know, and there are some, you know, all this white beard aside, there's new stuff to talk about. So I, I think I'll die saying, you know what else? And then, you know, I'll, I'll be dead. <laughs> Darren? I think it's um, it's a great reminder, Destiny, that whatever niche you're in, there's always someone new. Um, and for Pro Blogger, that, that was a lesson I learned probably two or three years in when I started to run out of things to talk about. Um, the the thing that kept me going with ProBlogger is that I realized after three years that I had a completely different audience to when I started and it was beginners and the, the beginners, they were just starting out. And so to go back over that stuff again and again and again is is really um, where ProBlog is at. ProBlog is a blog for beginners. It's not really a blog for advanced bloggers. It's, it's for those who are just starting out and we just last week we finished our starter blog course again we do it every year every february and then we take people through content and finding readers and engaging with those readers and monetization every single year we go through each of those different components um and that's really realizing that that i don't have to talk to the same bloggers for 20 years 
but I can take a new group through every year um, is is where it's at. And we we evolve the message because the the, the technologies are changing. Um, but yeah, that's where it's at. And I think you know, actually realizing if you can serve beginners again and again, take them to intermediate, then that's a that's a great way to go. Yeah, on Copy Blogger, we spent 15 years saying the same thing in a new and interesting way, or at least trying. And uh, for me personally, it, it started to wear on me because as I got more advanced, like you, the more you teach, the more your game goes up. And yet I wasn't able to really talk at that level because a new crop of beginners came in. So my response to keep my sanity at pretty much the height of copy blogger media was to start further and unemployable as just outlets. And now they're my two new companies that, you know, became time to run with after uh, the the two uh, acquisitions. So you, you've got to know your audience and how they turn over and what they need, but you also have to find ways to satisfy your own, you know, uh, intellectual curiosity or, or the, the kind of stuff that you're interested in, even if it makes no money for years, because someday you wake up and you go, oh, I can do this now. I actually learned some things and develop some expertise on this side as well. Uh, more, I'm talking more about further there than unemployable. But uh, anyway, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you, Destiny, for the question. Someday she'll be the answer to a trivia question. Who was the first live questioner on Seven Figure Small Live? So that was, that was very good, Destiny. Uh, we probably got time for about one more here. I'm going to read this directly from the chat. Uh, This is actually a question from Claire. She says, gosh, guys, can't believe I'm actually going to have a question read on Brian's podcast. This is probably the happiest day of my life. I'm just so excited. What's your go-to method for promotion and distribution this year? Wait, who asked this question? (laughs) Claire did. I'm ribbing her about the Brian's not my hero thing. Claire, Claire, (laughs) Claire. Wait, did you make that up, Jared? Yes, I did. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but the question is true. What's your go-to method for promotion and distribution yeah, this year? I knew that couldn't be real because Claire <laughs> just treats me with disdain. Now. Uh, <laughs> go-to. Um, I'm really interested in uh, advertising in other email newsletters. As everyone in the world starts an email newsletter, uh, you know, it, it's kind of the equivalent of everyone has a blog, so everyone's linking to one another. Well, you know, everything's kind of pay to play these days. So if you're looking for email subscribers, um, you know, I've heard anecdotally that the the conversion on Facebook ads, even as targeted as they are, it doesn't mean they want to be on your email list. And that is a challenge, uh, despite my other hatred for Facebook. So um, I'm not against using anything, (laughs) even giving Zuckerberg money, even though I don't want to. But no, it makes sense. Like when I say, if you want to build a great email list, make email the central thing, and that's the newsletter approach. Um, but also, if you want uh, people who read email newsletters on a specific topic, find you know congruent uh, email newsletters. And that's been tough for me for further because on one hand, it's great because it's unique. Gen X was basically an ignored market, uh, but that means there's no big dog email newsletter that I can just go to and buy an ad. I have to figure out what are the related topics, who's likely to have this demographic. So the whole demographic thing has been a challenge to me, but fortunately further is growing faster and faster through word of mouth referrals forwards, the ambassador program that we started. So that kind of answers your question in two parts right there. Darren or Chris go to promotion distribution methods, Darren. I'm not sure this really is promotion or distribution, but the thing that's worked for us the best on ProBlogger over the last two years is sprints. So doing really short, sharp teaching for a week uh, on a specific topic, and it, and it's almost like we've set up temporary <clears throat> communities. <clears throat> so it's not like we've got this virtual community, it's going to run for 14 years and we make these huge promises. No, we're starting this facebook group it's going to last a week we're going to teach you this to this and if you want to journey with us beyond that we've got our email list and we've got all these other places you can go but 
and and we build live video into each one of these sprints as well. So they're, they're daily live videos uh, and teaching and practical stuff that you can do. So for for us, that's been the the thing that our audience wakes up to the most. They don't have to join in with everything we do. They can choose which sprint they're going to do. And, and it's it's worked really well. We've done the same thing on digital photography school. Um, so it brings together email, it brings together yeah, the live video, it brings together Facebook groups um, and it's worked idea. really well. So that's kind of like the new version of the 30 day challenge that was really popular about yeah, five which years everyone ago, dropped right? out of after seven or eight days because 31 days is a long time. So we do seven yeah. days um, and that's sustainable. Yeah. Love that idea. Chris, last and word on Brogan, this. Brogan is broadcasting into Twitch. <laughs> yeah, I'm on Twitch now, but no. Uh, you... Uh-oh. He's frozen. <laughs> He's gone to Twitch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Darren wins. Darren <laughs> stayed on till the end. That's right. Chris dropped off. <laughs> that is right. All right, well, Chris was about to say something brilliant. We'll, uh, if he comes on here in the next few moments, we'll be able to get it. But otherwise, you can watch the Backpack Show and get Chris's latest uh, latest thoughts on promotion and distribution. Uh, Brian, any uh, any final thoughts here before we wrap up this episode of Seven Figure Small? You know, I'm just grateful for how flawless technology works, and uh, my friends uh, being able to uh, at least see them this what way. In, what am I in Australia? <laughs> you know well, the funniest all, comment: all these, all, these are old men who can't work out their zooms. <laughs> <laughs> the funniest, the funniest comment. On. The funniest comment in the chat. I'm not a cat. <laughs> when Darren was Just having trouble, was the internet flows the opposite direction in Australia, mm-hmm. and I, yeah, it does. I almost busted out laughing. I'm here but, live. Uh, it's not. I'm not a cat. <laughs> did, you, did you have that clip? Yes, you did. Oh yes. Oh, Jared yeah. actually wanted to talk about that story, and I vetoed him. Mm-hmm. Oh, that was so Ridiculous. funny. Ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you have window. a filter turned on. <laughs> <laughs> it's the funniest thing that's happened on the internet in at least a couple days. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Anyway, it's just good to see my friends, and I hope to see you in person very soon. Take care, everyone. Uh, we're going to get through this damn thing soon, I hope. Yes. So, Yes, we will. All right. And with that, we thank you all for listening. May your profits be big while your headaches stay small. And as Brian always says, keep going. Also, go outside.